Κυρίε και κύριοι, καλώ ήρθατε στη δεύτερη μέρα του διαδικτυακού προγράμματο τη Ένωση Ποντιακή Νεολαία Αντική. Η σημερινή εκδήλωση δεν σχετίζεται τόσο με τη γενοκτονία των Ελλήνων του Πόντ, όπω συνέβη χθε και θα συμβεί και σε επόμενε προβολέ μα. Είναι αφιερωμένη στο έγκλημα τη γενοκτονία γενικά. Για το λόγο αυτό, επιλέξαμε να εστιάσουμε σήμερα σε δύο ιστορικά παραδείγματα γενοκτονιών που συντελέστηκαν το προηγούμενο αιώνα. Αυτά αφορούν στη γενοκτονία των Αρμενίων, το ένα συστατικό στοιχείο, αν μπορούμε να το θέσουμε έτσι, τη τριάδα γενοκτονιών Αρμένιων, Ελλήνων και Ασύριων, καθώ επίση και στη γενοκτονία που συντελέστηκε στη Ρουάντα το 1904, τη τελευταία γενοκτονία του 20ου αιώνα. Ξεκινώντα με τη γενοκτονία των Αρμενίων, θεωρούμε χρήσιμο να παραθέσουμε συνοπτικά κάποιε έννοιε. Ο όρο Τριάδα Γενοκτονιών χρησιμοποιείται ω μια ευρύτερη νοηματική ενότητα που προσδιορίζει το έκτημα που διαπράχτηκε ει βάρο των χριστιανικών πληθυσμών τη Οθουμανική Αυτοκρατορία από νεότερου ξεκεμαλικού. Αρμένοι, Ασύριοι και Έλληνε ζούσαν στι πατρογονικέ του ιστορίε για χιλιάδε έτη και μέσα σε λίγα χρόνια αποδεκατίστηκαν στο βωμό τη δημιουργία μια καθαρή Τουρκία αμυγό μουσουλμανική. Οι χριστιανικοί αυτοί πληθυσμοί διαδοχικά στοχοποιήθηκαν και εξοδόθηκαν από του Τούρκου. Η Τούρκη Δημοκρατία, ω νόμιμο διάδοχο Οθωμανική Αυτοκρατορία, έχει την ηθική, πολιτική και νομική ευθύνη για το ιστορικό παρελθόν τη, έστω και προσπαθεί να αποποιηθεί την ευθύνη αρνούμενη την πραγματικότητα. Η Τουρκία διαχρονικά προσπαθεί να απαγορεύσει του απογόνε των θυμάτων να θυμούνται, να απαιτούν δικαίωση. Τέτοια χειρήματα συνιστούν όχι μόνο προσβολή των παθών των λαών, αλλά και βαριά προσβολή τη ανθρωπότητα. Σύμφωνα με τον διακεκριμένο καθηγητή Γκρέκο Ριστάτων, το τελευταίο στάδιο τη γενοκτονία είναι η άρνηση. Ο εκάστοτε γενοκτόνο μετά την ολοκλήρωση του εγκλήματό του αρνείται τα γεγονότα ή επιχειρεί να μειώσει την έκραση και τη σημασία του, ώστε να μην τα αποδοθούν ευθύνε. Για το λόγο αυτό, η Τουρκία επιδιώκει τη συγκάλυψη τη θηροειδία με την οποία είναι άρρηκτα συνδεδεμένο το νεοθωμαϊκό και κεμαλικό παρελθόν τη. Στην απόψηνή μα εκδήλωση, προσκεκλημένο είναι ο εκπρόσωπο τη Αρμενική Νεολαία Ελλάδο, κ. Γερβάν Μανουκιάν. Αποτελεί ιδιαίτερη χαρά για μα να έχουμε σήμερα εδώ μαζί μα μια νεολαία τόσο ενεργή όπω η Αρμενική Νεολαία Ελλάδο. Η νεολαία που εκπροσωπεί τον αρμένικο λαό, τον σύμμαχο και συνοδοιπόρο μα, τον αγώνα τη διεκδίκηση, αναγνώριση τη γενοκτονία Αρμένιων, Ασύριων και Ελλήνων. Κοντά μα λοιπόν ο κ. Μανουκιάν για ένα σύντομο χαιρετισμό. 19 Μαου, τιμούμε την μνήμη των θυμάτων τη γενοκτονία των Ελλήνων του Πόντου και με ανανεωμένη αγωνιστικότητα και αποφασιστικότητα διεκδικούμε. 101 χρόνια πριν για του Έλληνε του Πόντου και 105 χρόνια πριν για του Αρμένιου, οι νεότουρκοι σχεδίασαν και εφάρμοσαν τις γενοκτονίες των λαών μας, αφήνοντας αναχώματα ντροπή στην ιστορία της Τουρκίας, γράφοντας μία από τις πιο μελανές σελίδες στην ιστορία ολόκληρης της ανθρωπότητας. Τότε, η ακραία εθνικιστική και αδίστακτη ηγεσία της φθήνουσας Οθωμανικής Αυτοκρατορίας, μέσα στην απόγνωση της απώλειας της εξουσίας, έθεσε σε εφαρμογή το σχέδιο εθνοκάθαρσης, αρχίζοντας από τους Αρμένιους, οι περισσότεροι εκ των οποίων δολοφονήθηκαν, ενώ μόνο μερικέ χιλιάδε κατόρθωσαν να διασωθούν, βρίσκοντα καταφύγιο σε άλλε χώρε. Τα ίδια τραγικά γεγονότα θα ζούσαν μερικά χρόνια μετά και οι Έλληνε του Πόντου από τον ίδιο Θήτη. Έω σήμερα, η συνεχιζόμενη πολιτική άρνηση του τουρκικού κράτου μα προκαλεί μόνο αποτροπιασμό. Αποτροπιασμό διότι η Οθωμανική Αυτοκρατορική επιθετική αντίληψη επιβιώνει και στην σύγχρονη τουρκική πολιτική. Η ψευδεπίγραφη σημερινή δημοκρατία τη Τουρκία, επιβάλλοντα περιορισμού στην ελεύθερη έκφραση των πολιτών τη, καλλιεργώντα ακραίε αντιλήψει και φανατισμό, ποδοπατώντα το διεθνέ δίκαιο, αδιαφορώντα για τον ευρωπαϊκό χάρτη και προκαλώντα σε Ανατολική, Μεσόγειο και Αιγαίο, θέτει ουσιαστικά ερωτήματα για το είδο των σχέσεων που ισχυρίζεται ότι επιδιώκει. Η ειρήνη και διεκδικήσει κυριαρχικών δικαιωμάτων άλλων λαών δεν συμβαδίζουν. Η ειρήνη και ο δεν χωρούν στο ίδιο τραπέζι. Οι νέε γενιέ των Αρμενίων και του ποντιακού ελληνισμού ζουν και μεγαλώνουν στη σκιά του εγκλήματο τη γενοκτονία κατά των προγόνων του. Εμεί, η Αρμενική Νεολαία Ελλάδο, θεωρούμε απαραίτητε τι πρωτοβουλίε που μα βοηθούν να κρατάμε ζωντανέ τι μνήμε τη κοινή μα ιστορία. Ενέργειε σε πολιτικό και πολιτιστικό επίπεδο αποτελούν αναπόσπαστο κομμάτι της καθημερινότητάς μας. Συνεργασίες μεταξύ των Αρμενικών Εθνικών Επιτροπών, του Ποντιακού Κόσμου και των Ασυρίων, σε Ελλάδα, Αρμενία και όλη την Διασπορά, με αποτελέσματα όπως την αναγνώριση από κοινοβούλια και παγκόσμιους φορείς, με πιο πρόσφατη αυτή της Γερουσίας και της Βουλής Αντιπροσώπων των ΗΠΑ, 
καθώς και της Συρίας, καταδεικνύουν την σημασία των κοινών μας δράσεων. Για μας, κάθε επέτειος είναι η μέρα αναβάπτισης και επαναπροσδιορισμού του αγώνα μας ενάντια στις τουρκικές κυβερνήσεις για την αναγνώριση των γενοκτονιών που υπέστησαν οι λαοί μας. Η κοινή μας πορεία ενισχύει τον αγώνα αυτό και αναμφίβολα θα είναι νικηφόρος. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ τον εκπρόσωπο της Αρμενικής Νεολαίας Ελλάδος, κύριο Γερβάν Μανουκιάν, για το χαιρετισμό του. Στη συνέχεια του προγράμματός μας, έχουμε την ιδιαίτερη τιμή να φιλοξενήσουμε τον κύριο Κάρ Βίλκενς, έναν άνθρωπο που συνέδεσε άρρηκτα το όνομά του με την προστασία της ανθρώπινης ζωής κατά τη διάρκεια της γενοκτονίας στη Ρουάντα. Έχει ασχοληθεί με την εκπαίδευση και την ανθρωπιστική εργασία κατά τις δεκαετίες του 70, 80 και 90 στη Νότια Αφρική, τη Ζιμπάπουε, τη Ζάπια και τη Ρουάντα. Ο Κάρ Βίλκενς είναι συνειδητητής και διευθυντής του οργανισμού World Outside My Shoes. Ήταν αυτόπτης μάτρα στη γενοκτονία των Τούτσι στη Ρουάντα το 1994 και ήταν ο μοναδικός Αμερικανός πολίτης που επέλεξε να μείνει στη χώρα αφού ξέσπασε η γενοκτονία. Με μεγάλο ενδιαφέρον τώρα θα παρακολουθήσουμε το πρώτο μέρος της συνέντευξής του, η γενοκτονία στη Ρουάντα μέσα από τα μάτια του Κάρ Βίλκενς. Hi, uh, my name is Carl Wilkins and my wife and I were living in Rwanda with our three small children back in the 90s. In fact, I stayed there during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And I'd like to share that story with you um, using a couple of film clips from a film that tells the story through the eyes of our family during that time. There are, in the first two minutes, there are some graphic news archival footage of some of the families who were killed. So I just wanted to give that little warning if we have any younger folks who are watching. And I think that's, yeah, let's, let's begin. I think it was really interesting in Rwanda that when people were ordered to leave, uh, for some people, the idea of staying didn't even occur to them. And of course, the killing going on around here, the smart thing to do is get out of here. Get those who you love and safely get them out of there. The senior rebel official said the government forces and militia were responsible for the genocide of between half a million and a million people. I spoke to several refugees who said there aren't going to be any Tutsis left in Rwanda. But in every situation we have a choice. I mean, the choices might be greatly restricted. There's people who'd like to take that choice away and sometimes we'd like to give that choice to other people. But, but it boils down to, uh, really, we do, we do have a choice. And, and lucky is the person like me who had somebody like Teresa standing next to me um, making that choice together. Went to Africa the first time as a college kid. Came back to the States and uh, fell in love. So as soon as I got married with this beautiful girl, six weeks later we moved to Zimbabwe. Our daughters were born there, so Africa just kind of got in our blood. You know, I didn't give a whole lot of thought to what was ahead after, <laughs> after I say I do. I knew he was an adventurous person, and I was excited about living overseas. When we moved to Rwanda, our first projects were to build schools, working with ADRA, Adventist Development Relief Agency. Yeah, I met Carl Wilkins in 1990. 
time he came to be director for ADRA. Someone was surprised how American young have three kids faster than that. <laughs> one, two, one, one, two, one, two. We were excited to be able to raise our, our kids in Africa. And Rwanda, like other countries we had been in, was very welcoming. The neighborhood kind of took our kids in as neighborhood kids. The kids would go to school. Carl would do his work. I'd take the kids swimming and on birthdays. We'd go camping, so it was very normal for us. We were pretty much untouched by the, the conflicts that were simmering underneath. And we had two Rwandans working in our home, Janvier the night watchman, and Anita, who not only worked in our home, but she lived with us. And so Anita just proved to be a really kind, thoughtful, she was great with the kids. She would stay with us through the week. We had a room um, in our house with a separate entrance, and we grew to love her very much. Like part of our family. Family, yeah, that's the operative term here. Let me back up a moment. We had been there for four years, my wife and I and our children, the kids growing up there, great place for the kids to grow up. And then that night, April 6, Wednesday night, 1994, when the president of Rwanda's plane was shot down and he was killed, the relatively small group of men and women Politicians and business people who planned the genocide used that to launch the, the genocide, to blame the Tutsi people for the killing of the president. Now, I really want to make it clear that the Rwandan genocide was not uh, the result of one group of people who hated another group of people. No, it, it was a small group of politic extremist politicians who were manipulating the, the ordinary needs, I mean the basic needs of ordinary people. And among the first casualties were 10 Belgian peacekeepers. Um, and with their, with their murder, the UN left, took the 2,500 soldiers who could have stopped the genocide, who actually gave a, a horrible false sense of security, took them away. And of course, uh, before they left, all of the uh, embassies were making decisions to evacuate their people. And when we were told that, you know, we were driving out, they said, yep, let's meet at the assembly points, but don't bring any Rwandans. Now, remember I said family was the operative term. Well, we had this young lady who had lived and worked in our home for four years, loving on our kids. We had this young man who came in the evening as the watchman. Uh, they both had Tutsi ID cards. Uh, um, actually, let's go to another clip about this decision that my wife and I made, and it'll start with Laura Lane, the young uh, embassy officer, the consulate officer at the American Embassy, describing the evacuation process. My first and only priority in many ways was finding out where every single American was and how we would get them safely out. So it probably would be Friday evening, um, Therese and I would start making the decision about what we're going to do, and especially about Anita and Genevieve, who were targeted because of their Tutsi ID cards. The embassy had made it really clear that Rwandans could not be evacuated in the convoy, that that would put everybody at risk. And so that option was out. Thinking that they could stay and barricade themselves in the house, nah, the house would be broken into and they would be slaughtered. And so really, there just didn't seem like many options, except if, you know, I was able to stay, perhaps my presence would stop the militia. There was a huge respect for foreigners in Rwanda, a real valuing of foreigners. His personality, his heart was such that there was no other option because he saw people suffering and he can't just leave it and, and not do anything about it. For me, you know, it's a matter of, you know, can I can I stand with that? My parents were visiting at the time and I was really glad my dad could drive the family out so Teresa could be with the kids, but still. I think Carl recognized it was a hard decision, not just for him, but yet we could be looking at the possibility of never seeing each other again. The harder part of this decision was her part, definitely. Much, much tougher um, for her to leave with the kids. And I know at that point in time, his thinking was, and I agreed totally. I knew as ADRA director, he's there for not just the development aspect, but for the relief aspect too. He's been already working in these camps. And so it just seemed that 
there was it wouldn't be right not to stay you know the right thing to do is to stay i'll never forget standing by our bedroom window looking out at the city which is built on hills there in kigali and uh, holding her and and thinking you know this is what it's come to and and this is the right thing to do and so I'm on the radio now, and I was telling Laura at the embassy, I'm sending my wife and family to the American ambassador's home, over. She says, what do you mean you're sending them? We're all leaving, everybody, shredding documents, locking the doors, everybody leaving, over. And I said, no, I'm not leaving. You kind of pause, and you don't have a choice. And uh, yes, I do have a choice, and you can see this going back and forth. And, Finally, she says, okay, then I need you to sign on a piece of paper that you've refused the help of the United States government to leave Rwanda. And I remember thinking how incredibly hard of a decision that must have been to be separated from his wife and kids and make the decision to stay. He had the opportunity because he had an American passport in his hand to leave the country and find safety. And instead, he was choosing to stay and let the people that he loved the most in this world go on overland without him. In leaving, I did feel like, you know, we were abandoning him. And though he tells me he never felt abandoned, I, I just, you know, I, when, when we're all leaving and you're leaving someone behind, you do get that sense of you're abandoning them. A beautiful sunny day. This is Tuesday and uh, nobody can believe what is hidden by this beautiful sunny day. Here you can see is the corner of our yard. This house over here is just on the other side of the street. You can see the hole in their metal roof from where a small rocket landed this morning. There was a 24-7 curfew. The government said nobody is allowed out of their house. Um, the only people on the streets were the people who were doing the slaughter. The pastor and his wife who had joined me, she would buy stolen food or propane bottle over the fence. It was a survival time those three weeks. How can we get enough food and water just to survive? The morning I actually left the house, I remember thinking, hmm. We've developed a routine and this sort of feels like there's security here within the fence of our yard in our house. And now I'm venturing out and I wasn't sure what I would find out there. I had talked on the radio to the Red Cross. I knew the killing was still going on. So yeah, it was with a lot of uncertainty that I ventured out that first day. It was great to have Pastor Soraya along. I really counted on his advice. And then to have Dawson, one of my ADRA guys. We had been through tough scrapes already. Backing the car down the driveway, I knew the first roadblock was less than 100 yards away. Fortunately, it was a neighbor, the tailor man, who was there. Strange to see him instead of at his sewing machine having a machine gun in his hand. But he wasn't too difficult. But there was another roadblock we came up to, and they were shouting, Belge, Belge, as we drove there. You know, they saw a white guy in the car, and I guess thought I was Belgian. And I said, no, no, I'm an American. I'm not Belgian. And the guy says, ah, good. You know, there was a rumor going around that Belgians had shot the plane down. He says, because if you were a Belgian, um, and he kind of draws his knife across his throat and laughs and says, this is what would happen to you. And, you know, as we wandered through some of the neighborhoods, it was really strange. They were deserted like ghost towns. I remember this one guy sitting on a couch. They drug it out next to the street, and he had an old, like, shotgun across his lap and a monkey on a leash. And there were little kids who were playing with Westerner toys at a few places. I'm sure they hadn't seen those toys before. And, you know, stuff was drug out of houses and on the streets. It was, it was apocalyptic. It was just really like a whole different world. Finally, we, we made it to the office of the government headquarters. And as we were waiting there, I saw a man walk in with a military uniform. The guy had a real presence about him. Greeted people as he walked around. And as he came and talked to us, I introduced myself. And I explained that ADRA was still there. You know, not that we had much, but we wanted to help any way we could. And he said, well, yeah, there are some groups of orphans that are needing help. I can send you with my social affairs man to visit these orphanages, and you can see what you can do. 
it was strange that, that this man actually ended up giving me my marching orders. He's the one who, to a large degree, determined what I did for the remainder of the genocide. And he quickly put together the document I needed, the travel permit, signed it and stamped it. And I walked out of the office with this paper that was going to be so crucial to moving around the city. In so many stories, we're looking for the good guys and the bad guys. And Rwanda just really illustrates, like every, every story, especially hard stories of war and tragedies and stuff, they, they really illustrate the potential for good and the potential for evil in each one of us. Our work will, will begin to be bringing food and water and medicine to groups of orphans. And I want to introduce you to a couple of my colleagues, Dasan Hatikimana, courageous man, had a Hutu ID card so he could move through the roadblocks. However, his wife had a Tutsi ID card. It, the, as I said earlier, the Hutu and the Tutsi, they, they loved each other more than they hated each other. You could make a strong argument for that for all the marriages that happened, but it doesn't take much manipulation at times, or discrimination especially, and prejudice to, to poison a society. The other, the other key partner that I had during this time was my good friend Elise Gasigua. And I'd like you to actually hear him speak a little bit. He had, um, about the story, he had more than 40 people he was protecting in his home. People to come to my home. You are coming, coming. There's nothing, what can I do? I open, especially kids. And he said when the Intrahamwe would come to the place, he, he would give them a chicken. I mean, he had this little chicken farm and he'd give them a chicken, like a chicken for a life. And as I got out and I started to meet both the players in terms of those orchestrating the killing, but then also meeting people like Damas at Gasimba Orphanage with his 80 that eventually grew to more than 400, um, you started to see places where opportunities, where you could make a difference. One of the toughest days of the genocide started out just kind of ordinary tough. Gasik and I were trying to get water out to the orphans. We took our truck to the water source and filled our barrels with water and then headed towards the orphanage. And as we came in the gate, the young brother of the director, Jean-Francois, came out and uh, he says, well, you're, you're coming today as an answer to prayer. They were here yesterday and the last day or two they had killed about six people at the orphanage and they had just given the message the day before that they would come back the next day and kill everyone. Everybody. They said, we don't care who to or Tutsi, everybody here needs to get out or get killed. He's not even finished telling me the story. And all of a sudden, around us, we start to see them materialize. Some start to come in the main gate, others are coming through the hedges. So, Interham was crossing around, around it for that orphanage. Time we see car hurricanes, he's starting talking to each other. What's that Muzungu doing here? This was the beginning of what became uh, between two, and honestly, I can't remember, two, three hour standoff. Um, the militia just didn't move. They kind of positioned themselves all around the orphanage, but as long as I was there, they seemed not to be coming in. Kids was inside, they was afraid, they was crying, there was many people inside, the mothers and the fathers who were hiding there. I saw their leader drive by once. I saw him walk by another time. I said to Gasiqua, siphon the water out of the barrels into the reservoir as slow as you can. We gotta make this process drag on as long as we can. But eventually Gasiqua was finished. And in here, I was still there. He just wanted to move there. Waiting for Karwikas to go. And the Karwikas also, he just wanted to go. I remember talking, Mama Papa Zero, that was the UN humanitarian. Mama Papa Zero, this is Adra One come in and, and yeah, Sadra One, go ahead. And then my radio started beeping, indicating the battery is about dying. And I knew that they couldn't come really to my help. I mean, they couldn't get to that part of the city anyway. Um, but I was just calling for whoever. I talked to Philip at the Red Cross, you know, come in and Philip came in and says, hey, the director, Damas, is here in my office. I said, well, good, don't let them come back here. They're looking for him. And eventually, Philip was able to get a hold of the police, the gendarmes, and what kind of brought a pause in this standoff was a pickup truck load with seven gendarmes come in the driveway. And uh, their, their lieutenant gets out of the cab, looks around, military guy used to sizing things up, 
and uh, he comes to me, I introduce myself, I said, thank you for coming, can you spend the night with the orphans? No, no, we're too outnumbered. Listen, this is, you know, he's a man of action, this is what we gotta do. He says, um, I'll stay here with my men, but you need to get us reinforcements. At this point, the young brother, Jean-Francois, says, no, 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 don't go, Wilkins. As soon as you go, they're gonna kill us. Please don't go. And he starts to kind of get teary and, and don't go. And, and, and I'm looking at the lieutenant. Can I trust this lieutenant? You know, because some of the police had joined in massacres. So is this guy just wanting to get rid of me and he'll join the militia for this massacre? Or will he honestly stand there and hold them off? And, and I decide to trust him. I mean, it was a hard decision decision. It was, I felt sick to my stomach. I felt like I was going to vomit. Am I just trying to save my own skin, you know, or, or is this really the right thing to do? Trust this lieutenant, move forward. And I said, listen, Jean-Francois, I will, I will go get help. If I don't get help, I'll come back myself. I will come back. And, and it just seemed like a pretty weak thing that I was leaving him with, a weak promise. But um, I left, I, I, I thought, man, they could stop me at the roadblock right outside the orphanage and kill me there. Or, or maybe I'm going to hear gunfire as I leave. And well, I didn't. I went to the colonel's office and I knew he was out of town already, but I still went to his office. And I found um, the secretary there and the secretary says to me as if it's good news. Well, no, the colonel's not here, but the prime minister's here. Well, they had killed the prime minister the second day of the genocide and the extremists put in their own prime minister. And, and so the secretary's telling me, ask the prime minister for help. And I'm like, what? This is the one who's in charge of the genocide. Why would I ask this person? This just made no sense at all to me. But there's a lot of stuff that weren't, wasn't making sense. The prime minister, Kambanda was his name, came down the hallway. He's got a whole little entourage with him and they're coming down the hall. I step out in the middle of the hall, kind of you know, stopping them, put my hand out, introduce myself. I'm Carl Wilkins, the director of ADRA, and he goes, oui, je te connais. You know, this is going on in French. I know you, he says, and, and how's your work going? And I'm like, well, it's not going good. In fact, at Gasimba Orphanage, there's a massacre that's about to happen if it hasn't happened already. I just kind of blurted it out and he turns, talks, and he says, yeah, you know, after talking with his guys, we know about that situation. Those orphans are going to be okay. Kind of like, oh, okay. Thank you, and I shake hands and moves on down the hall, kind of leaves me stunned there. And yeah, uh, I don't know any other reason except this guy. He stopped the massacre. A couple days later, we were able to get the orphans moved out of that really horrible situation to a less horrible situation. Oh. How I would love to meet that secretary who told me, ask the prime minister. There, there's, there's so many new, new uh, un unexplained stories, and I would say new pathways in my brain as the result of the genocide. Uh, we often look for allies among people who think like us and, and look like us or speak like us. But finding allies among a group we call the enemy is a, is a powerful new pathway in my mind since the genocide. I can't begin to tell you how wonderful it was to be reunited with my family after three months. Wonderful for us, and yet, how are the people of Rwanda going to put the pieces back together? Nearly one in seven, more than a million people were killed at that time. Fortunately, the two people in our house survived. A young man actually went on and joined the military and did two tours of, tours of duty in Darfur, standing up against genocide. I get to go back and visit the young lady who since got married, her handsome sons, every time I, I go back to Rwanda. But the, the question students often ask me though, did anybody learn anything from the Rwanda? What did we learn from the Rwandan genocide? Let's listen to Laura Lane as she explains her ideas about the power of presence and perhaps how things could have been different from the perspective of the American government. I really wished, in hindsight, that we could have done the same thing at the American Embassy. And it is probably my greatest regret that um, we didn't keep the embassy open. At the time, policymakers said it was better to close the embassy down. Looking back now, boy, what a world of difference we could have made if we would have maintained that American presence.
Myself, who was fighting each other, is my brothers, it was their sister there, but no one help. But the car we can go to help some people, help the orphanage. And I saw he changed my life many things until now. To do good things, best than me to do wrong things. I saw people never help one another. And it was very painful my heart. Until now, how people run, how people died, no help one another, kill someone, no do anything wrong. He changed my life. It was the Rwandan Patriotic Front who ended the genocide. Many of their soldiers were refugees, Tutsis who had fled Rwanda at the time of independence. And as they came and liberated different parts of the country, liberated Kigali, how, how can you imagine? I can't, I can't imagine. I would guess that the historians, that the political analysts, they would say impossible. How do you rebuild a country that has suffered such amazing, not just horrific loss of life, that's just, that in itself seems like it would present an irreparable situation. But of course, trust in all of the institutions, in government, in churches, even in your neighbors. I, I have the privilege of going back to Rwanda every year, sometimes several times a year, um, often with groups of teachers to study about these questions in Rwanda. You know, how do, how do people go from kind and generous to murderers that journey and and how do people how do people come back can they ever be trusted again you see this beautiful you know the state of the art convention center you see all of the progress in rwanda but you can't help but wonder these questions why did they do it and can they come back and and the idea of the pathway to harm characterized by polarizing uh, actions, polarizing speech, polarizing mentality, thinking, and, and the pathway to healing, you know, represented by restorative practices, restorative justice. These are some of the questions that um, we'll have to perhaps explore in another, in another segment. But I do want to just share with you as we, as we close here, that I think there is so much reason for hope we have a small nonprofit that works with teachers called World Outside My Shoes, and we explore the values of respect, how when you build an environment of respect, you can learn each other's stories and the empathy begins to grow because that's, that's how we're wired. We hear each other's stories and we begin to connect the dots between your story and my story. And then it's just a natural next step for inclusion. Come on home, I want you to meet my family. So. I have a lot of hope for, um, for our planet, for Rwanda, for myself. And one of the ways we start having these conversations is through identifying our core values. And I really enjoy talking about respect, empathy, and inclusion, not just talking about it, but practicing it. Thanks very much. <laughs>